Well, when we pulled up this morning, I was surprised that y'all still had my name on the sign. I mean, the preaching you guys heard last Sunday with Pastor Clark and the preaching you heard Wednesday night with Pastor Chris, I thought one of those two names was going to be on the sign and mine was going to be off. So I'm sorry, but you got to settle for me this morning. We're glad to be back. Thank you for your prayers. Uh, I'll explain more Wednesday night. Come Wednesday night to hear more about our experience at the Southern Baptist Convention. And uh, you could come Wednesday night and hear about that. Well, happy Father's Day to you. As Pastor Chris already recognized, our men in the room want to thank you guys so much. If you have a copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn to Proverbs chapter 13, verse 24, and then Proverbs 14, verse 26. This morning, we are wrapping up a sermon series that we began on Mother's Day. You might remember on Mother's Day, we began a sermon series called Family Fatality. And so today, we're actually going to wrap up this sermon series. Today, we're wrapping this up. And so for the first four weeks of this series, we looked at five main fatalities that many Christian families can possibly make. In other words, if you neglect these things, they could potentially become a fatality in your home and for your family. We looked at the neglect and proper training. You might remember that message. What does that mean? That means neglecting to raise our children up in the ways of of the Lord. We looked at the neglect and parental respect and what it means to respect mom and dad, not just as a child, right, but also as an adult. And then we looked at the neglect and prioritizing intergenerational bonds. Now, what in the world is that? That means don't forget grandma and grandpa, right? And we looked at that that week. And then uh, two weeks ago, We looked at do not neglect positive habits in the home. Make sure that doesn't, if that's neglected, that could become a family fatality. And then this morning, we're going to wrap up this five-week sermon series. And if you're visiting with us, you say, Pastor, I haven't heard any of those messages. Well, guess what? You can go to our YouTube channel. You can find the Family Fatalities playlist, and they will play in order for you. Plus, you get a bonus video. You get the series overview video as well. can explain all of that to you. This morning, I want to speak to you for just a few minutes with a message I've entitled, The Neglect in the Presence of a Father. So, in other words, this is the last fatality that we're looking at, the neglect in the presence of a father. Let me put this sermon in a sentence for you. Christian families can stay away from the fatality of the absence of a father in the home when when fathers will regularly exercise discipline and respectively exemplify dedication. Now, two of the hardest Sundays of the year are Mother's Day and Father's Day. And the reason that is, is because that brings a flood of emotion to many, many different people for a variety of different reasons. Well, let me draw your attention to something that you know that neither Father's Day nor Mother's Day is in the Bible, right? These are holidays that we've come up with, that we've become accustomed to. Mother's Day became a holiday in 1914. Woodrow Wilson enacted it as a holiday, and that is when it became a holiday. But guys, it wasn't until 1972 That fathers got their holiday. So that's a great illustration. Hey, mama comes first. If mama ain't happy, nobody's happy, right? So Mother's Day was a holiday first. While neither of these days are mentioned in God's Word, we know that the Bible is clear that mothers and fathers are to be respected all year long, not just on a particular day. So you might do the same thing we're doing afterwards. You might have people over and you're celebrating with family and you're having a great time. But I just want to remind you, it's not just this one day, right? This is the one day that America has set aside. The Bible is clear that honoring mom and dad should happen all year long, not just one day. But Father's Day is particularly difficult for many people that are here. And I want to be very sensitive of that. I understand many of you have hurts today. Many of you have different things you're dealing with. I want to remind you that I have those too. So often we put pastors on a pedestal and we forget that they're people too, right? Many of you know the testimony when I was six or actually seven, my dad began a drug addiction that would last for a long time. My dad chose drugs over his family. That's a really, really sad reality, but it was true. And so some of you might have experienced a similar story that I did. But even in my story, I want to tell you that God moved, God worked, and God redeemed in that situation. And so 
On days like today, it is very difficult. And maybe your story's not like mine. Maybe your dad was physically in your home, but he wasn't actually present. What does that mean? Now, you can be a dad and you can be in the home, but you cannot be there for your child. Right? That happens just as much as the other. And, as our, and I want to tell you this, whatever kind of pain that you feel like is just swelling up inside of your stomach today, I want to encourage you with this simple thing. That if you are a believer in Christ, and if you are a Christian, then your heavenly Father is greater than any kind of earthly father you ever could have experienced. I want to remind you of that today. Don't let the same mistakes... I'm talking to you. Don't let the same mistakes that you might have seen growing up repeat themselves in you. You can break the generational curses. As the praise team just saying, good, good, Father, I want to remind you, he's just not good, good. He's perfect. Right? He is perfect. The greatest example of a father that we could ever have is found in Scripture. 1 John 4, 9 says, In this, the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. And then John chapter 1, verses 12 through 13, But to all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. You can only be a child of God if you know God and you have that relationship with Him. So this morning, we're going to look at the neglect in the presence of a father. If you have a copy of God's Word, and if you are physically able this morning, if you would, please stand in honor of the reading of the Word. And we're going to read Proverbs 13, 24, and then we're going to skip one page and go to Proverbs 14, 26. Proverbs 13, 24. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Now let's go to Proverbs 14, 26. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence, and his children will have a refuge. Father God, we thank you and praise you for the opportunity we have to open up your word and to see what you have to say to us this morning. Lord, thank you for filling up your house, Father. Now we ask you fill up our hearts with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Move in this place. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name and all God's people say, you may be seated. Now for the men and the dads that are gathered here this morning, the Lord does not want you to commit a fatality that is very common. A fatality that is very common in our world today is the, is the absence of a father in the home. That is very, very common. I'm going to share with you some statistics to back this up so that you don't think I just came up with it. But there was a pastor named Dr. David Chancey. He serves as a pastor in Georgia, in Fayetteville. And in 2020, he wrote an article. You can look it up. Not right now. You can look it up later. But he wrote an article entitled, Dads, Your Presence in Worship Matters. And in his article, he reviewed and looked over several years back about different attendance in his church. And in that church that he pastored, obviously it's not the case today. You can look around. The Lord has filled his house this morning. But in his church, the lowest attended Sunday of the year was Father's Day. In his church, the lowest attended Sunday of the year was Father's Day. That means that Father's Day attendance was lower than Labor Day, Memorial Day, and July 4th weekend. Which is why I want to preach on why we should not neglect this fatality. Because many people have experienced problems because this fatality has been ignored, right? The presence of a father has been neglected by many men. So I think it's important that we expound upon it. But in his article, he shared that Promise Keepers and Baptist Press collected the following data. This is staggering. If a father does not go to church, even if his wife does, only one child in 50 will become a regular worshiper. One in 50. If a father does go regularly, regardless of what the mother does, between two-thirds and three-quarters of their children will attend church as adults. Amen. Amen. Men, your presence matters. It matters more than you think that it does. He went on in the article to say, in a separate study that was conducted, when the father is the first in the family to come to Christ, 93% of everyone else in that family will follow through. Men, you cannot hide from it. You cannot run from it. 
and you can try to deny it all you want, but you cannot overcome the fact that the spiritual trajectory of your family rests on how you lead your family in the ways of God. The Bible is clear on what fatherhood is supposed to be like. So if you're like me this morning, you say, well, pastor, I didn't have a great example in a dad. Yes, you do. It's in God's word, right? A heavenly father. That's who you can rest in. That's who you can find comfort in. But this morning, instead of complaining and, and talking about, well, there's no presence of dads in homes, I want to talk about how fathers can change this. I want to give you two practical reasons from God's word about how you can fix this trajectory in your families and be about change. You said, Pastor, my kids are already grown up. Well, go ahead and enact the changes we're going to talk about this morning because your family matters. And as the head of your household, it's time you make a change. I want to ask you this question this morning. How can a father be sure to not make the mistake of neglecting their children by being absent in their life? Number one, they need to regularly exercise discipline. Look at Proverbs 13, 24. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. Now, all throughout this series, if you've been with us, discipline has come up time and time again. We had an entire message on Mother's Day about how mothers and fathers can discipline their children. But guess what? While we know that mothers and dads both have a part in that, dad, you're supposed to take the lead on that. You're supposed to take the lead on what discipline actually is. Proverbs chapter 13 and 14 are the section of Proverbs that are often known as the Proverbs of Solomon. And in these Proverbs, we do see and find a wise man. Solomon shares many phrases that can bring wisdom and clarity to our minds. And there are many Proverbs that allude to fatherhood, but the Lord's laid it on my heart to just share these two. And I believe if we apply these two truths this morning, it's possible that we can stay away from neglecting our children by committing the fatality of being absent in their life. In my opinion, there are not many things worse than a child who, or excuse me, than a father who deliberately chooses his own selfish ambition over his own children. Let me say that again. There are not many things worse than a father who deliberately chooses his own selfish ambition over his children. And guys, I don't just say that to sound cool. I say that out of scars. I live that. And I've told y'all before, if it wasn't for the men in the church, if it wasn't for my uncle and grandfather, guess what? I don't know what would have happened, right? Other people stepped up for me, and other people, you can step up for them. Of course, we know that we need to regularly exercise discipline, dads. And so the Bible is clear that fathers are to take the lead role on this task. Many mothers have to discipline their children because the fathers either aren't around to do it or they choose not to do it. Hey, let me tell you something. I know the Bible, you know, if the father's in the home, he needs to take the lead on discipline. But let me tell you something. I was and still am very afraid of my mother. <laughs> I mean, she put the fear of God in me, boy. Why? Well, she had to. She did not have a choice, right? She had to do that. If a father is regularly exercising discipline, here are two things it means for his kids. If a father is regularly exercising discipline, it means two things. Number one, it means that he is present. Now, I know the technological age has allowed us to do this whole FaceTime thing. You know, I, I, when we got back from New Orleans, I don't FaceTime much. So please don't FaceTime me. If you need to call me, call me. Don't FaceTime me. But I decided to FaceTime my mom the other night. And I was doing that. And she starts asking me, well, what room are you in? My room? Oh, well, I saw this or I saw that. Like FaceTime, you can just see everything, right? FaceTime is not an excuse, dads, for discipline. You actually need to be present. If a father is regularly disciplining his child due to the child's behavior, that means he is actually present and in the home. How can you discipline something, dad, if you don't see what's going on? Now, I'm not saying don't go to work. You need to go to work to provide for your family. But if you're at home at night, actually be there. Actually be present. You can be in the home but not be with your child. No matter how much we think technology has changed, you can't discipline your child if 
you aren't there. In order to regularly exercise discipline, you need to actually know what's going on in their life. You need to actually know the things they're struggling with, the things that they are seeing, the things that they are experiencing. And I believe a strong point can be made that the bigger issue is not fathers who are absent from the home, but fathers who are in the homes but are absent in the homes. Right? I mean, we've got dads that are physically there, but they can't tell you hardly anything about their child. I mean, they can't tell you, you know, how they feel, what they're going through. They can't tell you those different things. And I think that's a shame. I believe Solomon's point here is if you love your kids, you'll discipline them. Let me say that again. If you love your kids, you'll discipline them. If you love your kids, you'll discipline them. Being a part of disciplining them is also physically, emotionally, and mentally present in all aspects of their life, right? Dads, this means when you get home from work, take the time to play with your children and spend time with them. Eating dinner at the table with your family. Whatever needs piddling in the garage, it can wait. The weeds outside that need to be pulled or sprayed can wait. The man cave can wait. The video games can wait. But family or dads, your family's going to grow up whether you're there or not. Right? The human body is going to grow up whether you're there or not. You get to decide today whether or not you're going to be a part of your child's life. Because that time with your children and family that God, let me, let me give you this too. Three to four boys to be a part of that so that they can mentor them, right? So that they can raise them up. Why do they have to do that? Because the outside world has figured if you don't have men that are involved in the lives of their children, your crime rates are going to go up. I mean, if the outside world can figure that out, then don't you think we as Christians should be able to figure that out? Let me tell you something I loved about my granddad. My granddad was a sweet, loving man, but when he had to lay down the law, he laid it down. And he wasn't afraid to do that. As a pastor, we have to do that, right? But as dads, we need to do that. You need to stand your ground. Commentator Max Anders said, the father who spares his child from discipline Discipline at the proper time shows hate for him in reality because he does not care enough to teach him how to avoid dangerous behaviors. If your father loves you, he will discipline you. Because don't you know that our heavenly father does that with us? When we mess up, our heavenly father disciplines us. Let me read Hebrews chapter 12 verses 6 through 10. Hebrews chapter 12, 6 through 10 is a beautiful depiction of what our relationship to our heavenly father is to look like. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom, father, whom, whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them shall and live for they disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness that's Hebrews 12 verses 6 through 10 there have been many times in my life where God has had to discipline me due to decisions and choices that I've made let me remind you guess what when you make a choice that is your choice that is not somebody else's choice that you need to blame it on. That is your choice, your decision. Sadly, we live in a society where weak men are more prominent than strong men. Let me say that again. We live in a society where weak men are more prominent than strong men. There are fathers who choose not to discipline their children, and then later on they say, well, I don't know what happened. I, I took them to church. Well, I don't know how, what happened. I did the best I could do. Really? Hey, discipline hurts. It's not easy to do that. But guess what? It's necessary. Right? It's necessary and we should do that. Discipline, I want to be clear though, discipline is not abuse. Discipline is not an excuse for abuse. There's a big difference there between discipline and abuse. Ephesians 6, 4 is very clear. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in discipline and instruction of the Lord. There's a huge line there that does not need to be crossed. In other words, Dad, if you're upset, take a day until you do discipline. 
Still do it, but take a day. Allow yourself to calm down. J. Vernon McGee said this when he said, Don't whip them or discipline them when you are angry or talking in a loud voice. Wait until a time when you can calmly sit down with your child and talk with him and explain why he is being disciplined. Here's a word study for you. The English word diligent is translated. Let's look at diligent there. Whoever spares the rod hates his son, but he who loves him is diligent to discipline him. So what does that mean? That comes from the Hebrew word shakar. And shakar literally means to be early at any task. So don't wait until your child is 12 years old to start disciplining them. You need to begin to be diligent in this context of the verse is to start early. You've got to start early. In other words, if you have a child and they try to hit somebody, I, I don't remember, it was a church we were at before, and y'all know I like to hold babies. I tell you what, man, this baby would take his hand, and every time I would hold him, he would smack me as hard as he could. <laughs> and I would tell him, no, don't do that. No, don't do that. What are the parents doing? They'd, oh, that's funny, video, hit the preacher, woohoo, you know. I mean, that's, guys, you got to start early. You might think it's cute, but guess what? Sin is not cute when it grows up, right? It's not a cute thing. Sin is not okay. And so we can make sure that this fatality is not neglected, not by just regularly exercising discipline, but the final point this morning is respectively exemplifying dedication. So we need to regularly exercise discipline, dads, but we also need to respectfully exemplify dedication. Look at verse 26 in Proverbs 14. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence and his children will have a refuge. If you want to be a father that leads his family to the Lord, this proverb is a great place to start for you. When your family sees that you as the man of the house, the spiritual leader, are dedicated to the things of God, then they will be too. And here, here's something that's really going to step on some toes, but y'all know I don't, you know, I'm not worried about that. Don't just drop your children off on Wednesday nights. If you're not serving on Wednesday nights, you need to be in here. And you say, well, the service goes late sometime. Well, hey, you pick them up at 8.15. They say, Dad, why were you late? I was in service. I was being fed the word. Here's a problem. Many kids will grow up and they won't come back to church because they were just dropped off. Why would I need to go? Mom and dad didn't think they needed to go. And we've got folks that, hey, they'll be here on Sunday morning, but I'm going to drop the kid off. I'm not coming back for Wednesday night. If you want your child to stay in church, I think you need to be in church too. What we find in Proverbs 14, 26 is a proverb concerning refuge and security concerning the local family. Here's something very interesting I want to share with you. Fathers will spend thousands of dollars a year ensuring that their spouse and kids are physically protected and safe. Did you know that the security industry in America is worth $51.8 billion? I mean, that's cyber security, that's home security, that's car security. Hey, I remember one time, my, and I still have it in my wallet, my granddad gave me a special card that would not let anybody walk by me and scan my credit card. It was like a blocking thing that could block that. I'm like, wow, what in the world? That's pretty cool, you know? And that's important, and, and those things are important. I'm not demeaning your, the security of your family, but we will be so consumed with physical safety, yet most fathers aren't concerned in the slightest about their children's spiritual safety. Your spiritual safety, your spiritual security is so much more important than the physical. So, if the desire of your heart is to lead a home where you can respectively exemplify dedication to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, I believe you should seek to follow these two things that we find in Proverbs 14, 26. Number one, you've got to fear the Lord. Look at the first part of verse 26. In the fear of the Lord, one has strong confidence. We, when we have a healthy fear of the power of God, all the other things in our life will go in their proper priorities. When you have a proper view of God, fear of God, everything else is going to follow suit. When your children see you fear God, it will cause them to want to follow God. Let me say that again. When your children see you fear God, it will cause them to want to follow God. And you might be a dad here today and you say, Pastor, when my kids were younger, I messed up. I wasn't the kind of dad I needed to be. Guess what? 
You need to reconcile that relationship the best that you can. Number one, you need to ask God to forgive you. Number two, you need to go to your child, children, whatever your case is. Ask them for your, their forgiveness. You're not responsible. Hey, if they choose not to forgive you, guess what? Let God deal with that. You don't force that. You did what you were supposed to do. But then you do this. You start what? You start fearing the Lord. You start right then and there. Because guess what? Your daddy is still your daddy no matter how old you are. And no matter how much you don't like it or no matter how much you want to change it. Max Anders said, fearing the Lord provides security from all attacks, including temptations, as effectively as the walls of stout fortress. And this protection extends to a person's family. Let's do a quick word study. The English word confidence comes from the Hebrew word miktok. And miktok literally means a refuge, security, or assurance. So when we fear God, we can have confidence in Him and refuge. We have security and safety in Him. Now, what are the fruits that a father or mother are living a a life fearing the Lord? In other words, if a mom and dad are fearing God, what are some fruits that they are actually fearing Him? Number one, they have obvious and immense respect and reverence for the things of God. They respect God's house. They respect God's commands. They respect God's word. They teach God's word to their children. They support and attend the local bride of Christ, which is the church. They regularly have spiritual growth in their own lives. And then when they meet fleshly battles, they fight on their knees and not with their fists. And when they see a need come up, they try to feed, or excuse me, feel the need and not dismiss the need. When men begin fearing the Lord once again, praying for them. But it starts with the men in the church. It starts with the men in the church stepping up and caring for the widows. It starts in the home. It starts with men stepping up and filling needs in the church. Let me tell you, there's a man in the church. I'm not going to say his name because he doesn't want, you know, any kind of accolades. But there was a man in the church. We walked in the fellowship hall this morning for our new members class and the bathroom door was locked. And I didn't have time to do it, and, and I didn't really realize exactly what I needed to do in order to fix it. So I went to a man in the church, and I said, can you fix this? Within three minutes, it was fixed. It was done. No problem. That's what we need in the church. We need more men who are willing to step up and do the things of God instead of just talking about it. I'm just going to post about it, and I'll feel okay. When men begin fearing the Lord once again, I believe our nation will truly take a turn for the better. If we're going to respectively exemplify dedication, it starts with a healthy fear of the Lord. But secondly, as a dad, you need to foster a godly family atmosphere. Sure, you got to fear the Lord, but you need to foster a family atmosphere. Look at the second part of verse 26. And his children will have a refuge. Now, that English word refuge is not the same Hebrew word mikvah that comes from the word confidence. What this word is, it's the Hebrew word moxie. And moxie literally means a shelter, hope, and place of refuge. Dads, it is your responsibility to build an environment in your home that is a place of refuge. Security, safety, it is your job. Let me give you a funny illustration, but I don't want to lose you. Hannah and I have been married 10 and a half months now. It's been wonderful. But I have learned something in 10 and a half months. I have learned several things. And I don't have time to go into them, and don't ask me. But one of the things that I've learned is that when you hear a bump in the night, a hand's coming across the bed. Whew. Pretty, did you hear that? Huh? What? What? And then all of a sudden, you know, we, we're, we're pillow people. And so I'm buried in pillows. I woke up this morning. I couldn't see anything. I was buried in pillows. I loved it. Loved it. All of a sudden, this hand comes across, smacks me in the face. I'm like, whoa, I think somebody's here. Who's here? Did you call somebody? What's going on? Hey, I mean, you hear a bump in the night. You got to go check out what it is. Right? Most of the time, dads are going to take that role. So I get up and, ooh, you know, and I'm, I'm about to fall because I just woke up and I'm walking around. And I'm thinking to myself, I really, really hope that there's nothing out here. <laughs> so I check the phone. I make sure nothing went off on the cameras. And see, here's the funny thing I've also learned about marriage is that when those little cameras go off, what is that? 
oh, it's just a neighborhood cat walking by or whatever. I remember as a child, talk about men having to provide the security, and this is not as funny as mine because thankfully, whenever we've heard a bump in the night, I just get around, walk around, I go right back to sleep. I have no problem going back to sleep. And uh, when I was a kid, though, I slept through a home invasion. When I was a kid, my parents, um, they heard a bump bump in the night. My dad went to the door and there was a guy trying to get in. And if you guys know my dad, which some of you do, uh, <laughs> he went in the kitchen and grabbed a butcher knife <laughs> and thought that would be a great, you know, tactic. And so he was in his underwear and he was running outside trying to chase this guy. Now I was asleep during the entire thing, but my mom's told me about it many times of what not to do, right? <laughs> Call the police. But we need to, as dads, we need to provide a refuge, a place of, of shelter, a place of hope. The best safety plan that you can give your kids is teaching them the Word of God and living it out in front of them. That's the best safety plan that you can give your children. And praying daily that they will one day choose to accept Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. Parents, but dads especially, spend way too much time making sure their child is at every practice. With all the equipment that they need, they want them to throw every touchdown. They want them to hit every home run. They want them to score every goal. But they never talk to them about the most important thing in the world, which is a relationship with Jesus. If your child is the best first baseman or pitcher or softball player or, or soccer player, awesome. I might even give you a cookie. But guess what? If you don't teach them to have a relationship with Jesus... Every touchdown is in vain. Every home run is in vain. Every soccer goal is in vain. Every solo that your child sang at the musical is in vain. Unless they have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So you want to foster a godly atmosphere in your home? Why don't you prioritize God above every single thing in your home? And if we want to avoid the fatality of the absence of a godly father in the home, then men, it's time that we step up. But before you can step up, you got to step out of your comfort zone. Step up, but you got to step out. Regularly exercise discipline and respectively exemplify dedication. Now, I know this message this morning can bring up a lot of bad memories for folks, a lot of bad feelings. But I want to encourage you that even if your earthly father didn't regularly exercise discipline and respectively exemplify dedication, your heavenly father does that every day without problem. And if you don't know the good, good father, then I got some good, good news for you. The Greek use, calls it euangelion. I got some euangelion for you. What does that mean? That means good news, right? Good news for you, Because of his great love for you, he made a way for you to know him personally. For you to be able to call God Father. What's the Hebrew word for Father? Abba. Abba, Father. You say, how, preacher? John 3, 16. Many of us know it by heart, but do we believe it? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, the King James says, begotten, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Maybe you're a dad or you're a male present here today and you know and you've been squirming during the whole message. You know you're guilty of a fatality that has occurred in your home. Dads, if you don't want your children to be one of those statistics, then it's time you make a change. It's time that you fix this fatality. And for those that are like me that are not dads yet, but you might want to be a dad one day, guess what? We can go ahead and start now in trying to foster our godly homes before we have children. Today is the day that you take the necessary steps to fix those mistakes through the power of prayer and God's grace. Regularly exercise discipline, which means you'll have to be present and you'll have to show love by disciplining, but respectively exemplify dedication, showing your family that you fear the Lord and you desire to foster a godly family atmosphere. This Father's Day, choose to make a change that will affect future generations in your home for years to come. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity we've had to open up your word. And to see what you have to say to us. And uncles and grandpas and cousins and all kind of different godly figures in the room. Lord, I just ask, Father, that you'd break our hearts for what breaks yours. 
Lord, if we have dads in the room today, God, they are in and women as well that have not chose to accept you as our Lord and Savior. That is the first step in creating a godly home. Lord, we might have some folks here today that are just hurting, Father. I just pray during this time of invitation that you would wrap us in your arms and love us during this time. We thank you for what you're going to do in this time of invitation. And all God's people said,